Welcome to the RSET training, Earth Observations for Humanitarian Applications. We thank you for your participation, and wherever you are joining from, welcome. My name is Sean McCartney. I'm an RSET trainer based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the first part of this three-part webinar series. For those who are new to RSET trainings, the following slides provide a brief overview of the program. RSET is an acronym which stands for the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. RSET is part of NASA's Earth Action Capacity Building Program. RSET provides accessible, relevant, and cost-free training on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, tools, and applications. The goal of our trainings is to increase the use of Earth science, remote sensing, and model data in decision making. And our trainings are tailored to audiences with a variety of experience levels, from introductory to advanced. On the right of the slide, you can see the six different thematic areas in which we conduct trainings. Trainings are offered online and in person and are targeted to beginners and advanced practitioners alike. Trainings are freely available and conducted either live, instructor-led, or self-guided, such as our Fundamental to Remote Sensing. Since 2009, the program has reached over 100,000 participants from over 170 countries. All our trainings are cost-free with materials offered in bilingual and multilingual languages and are freely available to use and adapt for your curriculum. If you use the methods and data presented in RSET trainings, please acknowledge the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. If you want to learn more, please visit our website. The following slides provide an overview of the three-part webinar series on Earth observations for humanitarian applications. So why would someone want to take this training? More than 114 million individuals have been forcibly displaced worldwide as a result of persecution, conflict, violence, or human rights violations. Refugees, internally displaced people, and other displaced populations are made more vulnerable to climate change impacts due to their socio-political marginal marginalization. Recent Earth observation-driven research that recognizes this has made progress toward characterizing the manner and magnitude of climate-related risks in humanitarian settings. By the end of this training, participants will be able to recognize the importance of measuring flood risk, long-term heat stress, and drought effects in refugee and IDP communities around the world. Apply workflows incorporating Earth observations, geospatial, and demographic data to identify localized climate risk in refugee and IDP settings. Discuss decision-making strategies for mapping and managing climate conditions with risks faced by refugee and IDP communities. And summarize opportunities and shortcomings of specific Earth observations and geospatial data sets for climate risk and development indicators in humanitarian settings. Prerequisites for the three-part training are listed below, along with links to each training. Over these three weeks, from June 6th to June 20th, there will be three one-and-a-half-hour sessions which will include presentations, demonstrations, and question-and-answer sessions. All materials, code, and recordings from each session will be available from the training webpage. If you are not able to attend one part, a recording will be made available within 48 hours of the training day on the RSET website. Homework opens on June 20th and will be due on July 5th. You will be able to access the homework from the training page on the last day of the training. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live sessions and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. The objectives for the first part of the training are as follows. By the end of part one, Participants will be able to identify and apply open geospatial data sets, global model outputs, and Earth observation data and products to undertake flood risk assessments for refugee camps anywhere in the world, and recognize specific humanitarian challenges when assessing flood risk in refugee camps. Please put your questions in the question box, and we will address them at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go. We will try to get to all of them, uh, we try to get to all of them by the end of the webinar. The remainder of the questions will be answered in the question and answer document, which will be posted to the training website prior to next week's training. It is now my pleasure to introduce the guest trainers for today's webinar, Dr. Mark Trigg, Dr. Mark Bernhoffen, 
Luxon Katsi, and Ruby Patterson. Dr. Trigg is a pro professional scientist and chartered engineer with experience in hydrology, hydrogeology, and hydraulics, with particular interests in integrated catchment management, flood risk, and water resource issues, and has experience working in many climates and countries. The common theme throughout his career has been the movement of water in natural and modified environments and understanding these complex processes and their interactions with infrastructure over a range of geographic scales. Dr. Bernhoffen is a research associate at the Oxford, Associ Oxford Sustainable Finance Group. His research focuses on the interpretation and use of climate risk analytics by financial institutions as part of the UK Center for Greening Finance and Investment. Mark recently completed his PhD at the University of Leeds. His doctoral research involved the validation of global flood models, examining the impact of river size representation on global flood model reliability, as well as evaluating and applying different global data sets of exposure and vulnerability. Luxon Katsi is a WASH sector lead for the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. He supports a coordinated response that ensures refugee access to water in sufficient quality and quantity and access to quality sanitation services while promoting improved personal and environmental hygiene. Ruby Patterson holds a master's in science in water, sanitation, and health engineering from Leeds University and has several years experience as a support officer for Oxfam. Dr. Trigg, over to you. Thank you, Sean, for the introduction. Greetings to everyone who's joined this training. I'm Mark Trigg, and I'm starting this part of the training. OK, let's kick off with section one. So today we will have three sections to the talk. The first section is a general introduction to the refugee camp context, and also an introduction to flood risk assessments, which I will be doing. The second section will be a hands-on example of carrying out a flood risk assessment for refugee camps in Ethiopia. This will be ably demonstrated by Mark Bernhoffen. And the final and third section will be a look at the realities of flood risk management in refugee camps, given by Luxon Katsi and Ruby Patterson. The substance of this training is based on ongoing research and experience of all four of the presenters over the last five years. We hope you find it interesting and useful. First, let's have a look at the context. There are a lot of refugees in the world. Currently, there are over 100 million refugees worldwide, which equates to one in 200 people on the planet. The numbers of refugees are also increasing, as shown by this plot here, broken down by region. UNHCR, which is the United Nations Refugee Agency, estimates that approximately 20% of these people live in refugee camps. Refugee camps are meant to be temporary accommodation, offering immediate shelter to people fleeing violence or disasters in their own countries. While UNHCR's current policy is to pursue alternatives to camps whenever possible, camps are still, unfortunately, a reality of life for tens of millions of people. Today, we are focusing on the flood risk to refugees living in these camps. When we look at where refugee camps are located globally, we see that they are predominantly in nearby countries with similar socio-economic conditions. The plot on the right illustrates this, showing that 80% of the refugee population globally is hosted in countries with only 19% of the world's cumulative wealth. Many of the host countries do not have the resources or capacity to manage flood risk for their own population, never mind refugees. In addition, we know that these low middle income countries are most likely to be impacted by climate change which is expected to result in more frequent extreme climate events like flooding that we're looking at today. If we examine the individual locations of camps, we see that most are located near international borders. We can see this for the camps in Ethiopia in the map on the right here, which comes from a recent study we did on flood risk to refugee camps in Ethiopia. The plot also shows that many of the camps have been around a long time, increasing the probability that they may experience an extreme flood event. 
The choice of camp location is usually dominated by factors other than flood risk, but we will hear more about that in section three. The camp locations are often in a remote, unused areas away from population centers. This means that there is less information and data for these areas and less infrastructure for flood management and response. If we look at the people who live in the camps and the infrastructure of the camps, we see that both are especially vulnerable when it comes to flooding. The demographics include more people that will be susceptible to flooding. They have limited mobility to avoid risk being confined to the camps. They lack a sense of place and their normal coping mechanisms and resources to be resilient to flooding uh, are lacking. The high population density in the camps and the criticality of the support infrastructure also means that they have concentrated exposure to flood risk. On top of this, many camps have poor drainage systems which exacerbates any flood event or may even turn normal intense rainfall into localized flooding. Now I'll introduce the flood risk assessment process. In this section, we're gonna have a brief look at flood risk assessments to set the scene for the second practical hands-on section that Mark Bernhoffen is going to do. FRAs are widely used by many countries to help understand and manage flood risk. They're an objective and quantitative process of assessing the likelihood and consequences of flooding. They allow decision makers to prioritize actions based on risk and provide input to planning, infrastructure and emergency plans. We've been using the word risk a lot and people often feel they understand what risk is. However, humans are notoriously bad at assessing and understanding risk. It is less intuitive than we realize. However, if we want to carry out an objective assessment of risk, we're going to need a rigorous definition. For flood risk assessments, we define risk as a compound product of three specific components, hazard, exposure and vulnerability. This is illustrated in the figure here and I'll go through these one at a time. Flood hazard has a specific source such as a river, intense rainfall or even the ocean. We're generally considering it as an unusual event that is relatively uncommon. We measure this frequency of occurrence by the hazard probability. For example, you may have heard of return periods such as one in a hundred year event, also more correctly known as the 1% annual exceedance probability. This helps us identify the specific magnitude or intensity of the event that we are going to use in the assessment. We use variables such as flood extent, water depths and water velocity to quantify this hazard magnitude. It's very common to use a computer flood model to provide flood maps and data for risk assessments. Now, if a flood hazard is present in a particular location and there's nothing of importance to us in that location, then there is no risk. So the second component of flood risk analysis is that there must be something there exposed to that hazard. This means we need to have a specific thing we are assessing flood exposure for and know where those things are relative to the flood extent. Usually this is assessed using geospatial data which shows where things are located. For example, maps of building footprints. The final component of risk is vulnerability which is a measure of how the flood intensity may affect the thing that you're assessing. Vulnerability generally increases as the magnitude of the flood variables increase. So for example, as flood depth and velocities increase, more damage is caused to a structure. It should be noted that there are different ways to measure vulnerability and different kinds of vulnerability. For example, people may 
uh, be physically vulnerable to being swept off their feet by shallow, fast flowing water or by drowning in deep water. But research shows there are also mental health issues and economic productivity effects of flooding, which increases the dimensions of vulnerability beyond the physical. So we come back to our final definition of flood risk, which is we require a flood hazard of a specific magnitude, exposure of the thing that we're assessing to that hazard, and a measure of vulnerability to flooding of the thing we are assessing. Now I'm going to just quickly illustrate the flood risk assessment process for you to show you what one looks like visually. Imagine you've been asked to carry out a flood risk assessment for an urban housing estate, such as the one shown on this map. The first thing you do is identify the area that you'll be assessing and what thing you're going to measure. This could be people at risk, economic damage to buildings, and so on. Here we identify the boundary of the assessment area. Then you identify the sources of flooding. For example, here we're looking at river flooding, also known as fluvial flooding. High intensity rainfall can also cause flooding, known as pluvial flooding, especially where there's poor drainage. But for this example, we're only looking at the river as the source of flooding. We undertake some computer modeling of the river flooding for a specific probability of event, such as the one in a 100 year return period. This results in the flood map we can see now overlapping the housing estate. Now, if we're assessing buildings in the estate, we need to know where the buildings are and we need the footprints of those buildings to see if they're exposed to the flood extent modeled. These are now identified on this slide with square meter area labels on each footprint. Now we know where the buildings are that are exposed to flooding, we can carry out an analysis that defines different measures of risk. This could be a simple count of buildings exposed to the hazard or, an, or the number of people living in those buildings. Or we could do something more sophisticated if we have the data and use this to assess economic damage to the buildings, for example. To do that, we need to know how the damage increases with increasing flood depth. These are called depth damage curves, such as the, the one shown in the plot on the top right. So if we know the depth of flooding and building area exposed to that depth of flooding, we can multiply the two to calculate the exact loss in financial terms. If we then sum this up for the whole housing estate, we get the total loss for this magnitude of event. So how do we apply this process to refugee camps to measure flood risk objectively? We've seen that we need good data and analytics to carry out a flood risk assessment. I've already mentioned the context of refugee camps as being in data scarce regions. This means we rarely have flood models. We often have poor maps of the camps and structures in them. And finally, refugee camps are very different to a settled population in terms of vulnerability. And this in particular is extremely poorly studied at the moment. Just for a quick example of differences in vulnerability, imagine how resilient the two structure types shown on this slide are to flooding. While the solid buildings on the left will suffer some damage, they will be much more robust to deeper and faster floodwaters than the tents in the camp on the right. Now, if you picture the fact that refugees also have their few belongings and bedding for sleeping on the ground, you can see that it will not take much depth of water to cause huge problems. The good news is that we are now in a position to carry out objective flood risk assessments for refugee camps. This is now possible due to significant improvements in the resolution and amount of data we need to undertake the flood risk assessments. This includes global flood hazard models that are underpinned by global earth observation data, faster computers and faster flood algorithms. The res resolution of data sets has now improved to the point where we can carry out meaningful assessments at the scale of refugee camps. 
As well as flood hazard data improvements, we have also seen advances in geospatial exposure data, mapping of structures using high resolution satellite imaging and machine learning means we now know where individual buildings are located. Fusing this with crowdsourced mapping initiatives, uh, such as OpenStreetMap, uh, has also improved our ground truthing and community ownership of that data. Finally, the mapping and monitoring of floods themselves from space has matured to the point where we routinely use these event-based flood maps to test and validate flood models as well as to monitor almost in real time the effects of flooding on communities worldwide. It is in this context of the new abundance of data that we are able to carry out flood risk assessments in these data scarce contexts where we find most refugee camps. Now I'll hand over to Mark Bernhofen, who will illustrate this process for camps in Ethiopia. Over to you, Mark. All right, thanks so much, Mark. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Mark Bernhofen. I'm a postdoc at the University of Oxford. And in the second section of this workshop, I'm going to be taking you through a hands on practical session where we're going to be using global and local data to assess flood exposure and risk to refugee camps in Ethiopia. So to follow along, you need to have QGIS installed on your computer. If you don't have it on your computer, you can download it for free from QGIS.org. We'll also be providing you with some data to conduct the flood exposure assessment. This includes flood maps, camp locations and boundaries, camp information, as well as building footprint data. And you can download the data for this exercise from the Zenodo repository, which is linked below or by scanning the QR code on the right-hand side of the slide here. Uh, so the folder you download uh, will contain both the data you need to follow along with the exercise, as well as detailed instructions for, for carrying out the analysis. So I'll start by giving you a bit of background to the exercise we'll be doing. Ethiopia hosts the third largest population of refugees in Africa. Over 90% of these refugees live in 24 camps throughout the country. Uh, and this map on the right shows, shows you where these refugees are located, as well as the countries that they've originally come from. And refugee camps in Ethiopia have a history of flooding. For example, in 2014, two camps in the Gambela region had to be evacuated and the camps had to be abandoned uh, due to severe flooding. And the figure on the bottom right shows the aftermath of the flood in, in one of these camps. And unfortunately, flood risk data is often hard to come by in many of the remote regions that these camps are located. So last year in 2023, we wrote a paper trying to ask how can global flood risk data potentially fill some of these data gaps in these regions? And how could they be used to understand refugee camp flood risk in Ethiopia? And what we found in that paper was that global population data, which is the exposure data that's typically used in such assessments, isn't appropriate for analyses at, these, at this scale. Um, global population data sets actually miss many of the refugee camps in Ethiopia. What we found is that if global data is used in such assessments, it needs to be supplemented with local data where it's available. So what can these data sets be used for? Well, they're useful for giving you a first order understanding of flood exposure and risk. They can be used to help identify high risk camps at the at the national scale. And they can also be used to give you a very preliminary understanding of risk within the camps. And over the course of this hands on exercise, I'm going to demonstrate both of these use cases to you. So this slide summarizes the data we'll be using for the assessment, which we provided to you in, in the folder. We have data on camp boundaries and camp information. The camp boundaries were manually delineated using satellite imagery and camp coordinates provided by UNHCR. And we took information on camp populations and demographics and extracted these from, from UNHCR camp profile reports. The flood data we use is uh, version two of the global flood hazard maps produced by Fathom Global. 
These maps cover, cover both fluvial, uh, which is river flooding, as well as pluvial, which is rainfall driven flooding for a number of different return periods. For the purpose of our analysis uh, in this exercise, we combine the fluvial and pluvial maps into one combined flood map, and we use only the, the one in a hundred year return period flood map. We also use building footprint data to understand where buildings are located within the camps. And we have two sources of building footprints. We use open street map data, which are community mapped uh, building footprints, as well as Google open buildings data, which are automatically extracted from satellite imagery using uh, machine learning algorithms. So the hands-on exercise will consist of uh, two exercises. In the first exercise, we'll be conducting a national level refugee camp flood exposure assessment. And to do this, we'll overlay global flood maps with, with camp boundaries. And this assessment will allow us to answer questions such as how many camps are exposed, which camps are most exposed, and where shall I conduct more detailed assessments. In the second exercise, we'll carry out one of these more detailed assessments in a single camp. And this will involve incorporating building footprint data to understand which buildings are exposed within the camp. It'll also involve incorporating vulnerability information to understand how different flood depths might impact different buildings within the camp. And this table on the bottom right hand side of the slide here shows the vulnerability information that we'll incorporate. Where different flood depths are classified into four different risk categories, ranging from low to very high. All right, and now let's jump straight into the, the assessment. All right, so now to begin the actual hands-on exercise. So we're gonna be doing this in QGIS, um, and we're gonna assume that you already have QGIS installed uh, on your computer. Um, we've got instructions for, for installing QGIS in the documentation provided in the, the data folder. So when we get to QGIS, the first thing we're going to do is click on this blank sheet in the top left hand corner to create a new project. And what we're going to do to begin with is we're going to upload or we're going to load the, the camp boundary data. And to do this, we're going to go up to layer, add layer, and we're going to add a vector layer because the camp boundary data is a, a vector layer. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna navigate to our folder that we provided, so this data folder. We're gonna go to the camps folder and we're gonna click on the camp boundaries Ethiopia file. And we're gonna make sure that we're clicking on the file with the extension .shp, so the shape file. If we choose the other files, we'll have trouble loading these into QGIS. And now you can see we've got a number of different camps loaded into the workspace. And if we right click on the layer that was just loaded and go to open attribute table, it will then open this table with all the information on the refugee camps that we have. So we have a column of camp names, the year the camp was established, what the population of the camp is, what region in Ethiopia it's located in, the original country that the refugees have come from, as well as the area of the camp. And if we want to inspect any of these camps in more detail, we can right click on them and go zoom to zoom to feature. And this zooms in on the camp. Um, but to better visualize what these camps look like, we want to also introduce some sort of satellite imagery in the background. So in this browser window to the left hand side of the screen here, we're going to go to XYZ tiles and we're going to click on Google satellite. We're going to double click on that and that will load some background satellite imagery so we can see what the, the, the camp actually looks like. We also want to update the styling on our camp boundaries so that it's not just this, this big filled in shape rather we want to just look at the, the boundary of the refugee camp. So what we'll do is we'll right click on the layer. We'll go to properties. 
And when this window opens, we want to make sure we're in symbology on the left. In this uh, symbology window, we'll click on simple fill. And then we'll go down and choose the appropriate fill style. So we want to change it from solid to no brush. So this removes the, the filled in color. We may also want to make the thickness of the, the camp boundaries a bit uh, thicker so that we can see these better. And then we'll click OK. And here now we can see the, the camp boundary as well as the sort of satellite imagery of the camps. OK, now that we've loaded the, the camp boundary data, let's also load the flood data. So again, we'll go up to, to layer. We'll go to add layer. And we'll go and add raster layer because the flood map we're using is a, a raster layer. We'll browse to the, the folder that uh, we were working in earlier. We'll go to data and this time we'll go to the flood folder. So in that flood folder, we've got this fluvial pluvial RP100 uh, file. This is our flood map. So we'll click open and click add. And we can see our flood map has now been loaded. If we want to view it for, for the whole of Ethiopia, let's right click on the flood map and go up to zoom to layers. So now you can see the flood map for the whole of Ethiopia. But you'll notice that it's it's been loaded with its sort of default styling where it's sort of graduated from black to, to white depending on the flood depth. Now, this isn't the best way to, to visualize the map, so we'll update the styling of the raster layer. So again, we'll right click on the layer, go to properties and make sure we're in symbology. And then in the bottom left-hand corner, we'll click on style and load style. And we'll navigate to the, the same folder again, go to flood and we'll choose flood depth style. So we've pre-created a, a flood depth style uh, setting layer for you so we don't have to go through this in the exercise. So if we click open and click OK, this is now update, updated the styling of the, the flood map. So now we can see that these sort of light green, light blue areas are flood depths with a, a, a depth of two meters or greater and these darker blue and, and black flood extents are where there's a shallower flood depth. So you can see this is a better way to, to visualize the, the flood map. So now that we've got both our layers um, loaded in QGIS, what we wanna do is we want to uh, conduct a flood exposure assessment. And to do this, we're going to we're going to use the, the processing toolbox. We're going to use one of the tools within QGIS. So make sure that we open the processing toolbox by clicking this, uh, this gear symbol right here. And when the processing toolbox opens, we're going to type zonal statistics. And we're going to choose the zonal statistics tool as the one we're going to use. So double click on that and it'll open the window. And what the zonal statistics tool does is for areas where a raster, which is our flood map, overlaps with a, a vector data set, which is our camp boundary data, you can calculate some statistics in those areas of overlap. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna count the number of flooded cells within each camp. So in our input layer, we're gonna choose our camp boundary data set. For our raster layer, we're gonna choose our um, flood data set. Um, in this output column prefix uh, uh, area, we're going to write flood underscore. So this will uh, produce a new column in our attribute table with the statistics we calculate. And then we're going to choose what stats we want to calculate. So we just want to calculate the count. So we want to count how many flooded cells are within each camp. And then we can either save this to our uh, disk or we can just click run and it will create a temporary layer. And that's what we'll do now. So you'll see that this new uh, layer, which was produced, this zonal statistics layer, is basically the, the camp boundaries data set replicated 
but with some additional statistics calculated. So if we right click on this and go to out open attribute table, you'll see we have the same information as previously, but now we have an additional column with the, the number of flooded cells within each camp. And what we're gonna do is we're now gonna do some math on these columns to calculate our flood exposure statistics. And to do this, we're gonna use the field calculator tool. And you can open the field calculator by clicking the abacus right here. And what the field calculator allows us to do, it allows us to calculate math based off the different columns and rows within this table. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the population exposed to flooding in each camp. And we're going to make a few assumptions to do this. So first, we're going to assume that the population is evenly distributed across the camp area. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the proportional area of the camp that's flooded and then multiply it by the population. So here we're going to create a new column called F underscore exposed for flood exposed. And in this expression uh, box, we're then going to type a formula. So the first thing we want to do is we want to convert the flood count column to a flooded area column. And we know that our, um, our flood map has a rough resolution of around 90 meters by 90 meters. Um, so we're going to say flood count, which is that column, times 90 times 90. And this will convert the flood count column to our flooded area column. Now, we should note that if you want to calcul calculate detailed areas in QGIS, um, you're going to have to be working in a, in a different projection that's better for calculating um, areas. For the purpose of this tutorial, I think uh, this simplification is okay, but if you want to calculate detailed areas, you need to look at working in other projections. And we go into a bit more detail about this in the, the documentation that's been provided for you. So now that we've calculated the, the flooded area, we then want to calculate the proportional area uh, that's flooded within the camp. So what we'll do is we'll We'll close, put this expression in closed brackets, and then we'll divide this by the area column, which is area underscore M2. So this will give us the proportional area uh, that's flooded within each camp. Now, the final operation is we'll multiply this proportional area by the population within each camp. So again, we'll want to close this expression in brackets. And then we want to multiply it by the population column. So times population. And then we'll click OK. And now we'll have a new column that's been calculated, which will tell us the, the number of refugees exposed to flooding in each camp. And if we click on the column header, we can then uh, sort these in ascending or descending order based on how exposed uh, how many people are exposed within each camp. And this should give you an idea of, of which camps are, are more exposed to flooding than others. But what you might see here is that this is the absolute number of refugees exposed to flooding. And it could potentially be biased towards camps that have a higher overall population. So what we might wanna do in addition to calculating the absolute number of people exposed, we might also want to calculate the percentage of uh, refugees exposed within each camp. So we'll, to do this, we'll again open the field calculator. We'll have a new field name called P underscore, underscore exposed for uh, percentage exposed. And this time the formula we'll uh, incorporate into the expression box is the population exposed column, the F underscore exposed. And we'll divide that by the population column, which gives us the proportion exposed uh, within each camp. Now, to convert this to a percentage, we'll close this e expression in brackets and then multiply by 100. And if we want to make sure that our results are a bit more precise than integer numbers would allow for, we can update the output field type from whole number to decimal number. If we click OK, 
you can see that we now have two columns, one with the absolute number of people exposed within each camp, and one with the percentage of uh, people exposed within each camp. And these can both inform us about which camps are, are most exposed uh, to flooding. And you can see how this could be useful for pinpointing uh, specific camps where we can do uh, further detailed analysis. And that's what's going to take me on to, to the second exercise in this hands-on activity, where we do a detailed analysis in a, a single camp. And the single camp that we're going to look at is the second most exposed uh, from a percentage standpoint, this Barali camp. So let's zoom to this camp. So here you can see what the, the sort of flood extent looks like within the camp. Um, but we also want to incorporate some more detailed data into this camp flood risk assessment. So we're going to incorporate some building footprint data. So again, we'll go up to layer, add layer, and again, we'll add a vector layer because that's what the camp footprints are. So again, we'll navigate to the camp folder, and this time there's a footprint folder within the camp folder. And we'll choose the Barale OSM for OpenStreetMap footprints data set. If we click open and add, we can now see the, the, the different buildings uh, and where they're located within the camp. And if we overlay this with our flood map, you can see that quite a few buildings are exposed to flooding within this camp. But not only are they exposed to, to flooding, but different buildings are exposed to different depths of flooding. And this could have different consequences. So we need to also incorporate some information about the, the different depths of flooding and what this might mean for flood risk to these buildings if we want to conduct a, a camp level risk assessment. So another operation that we're going to do is we're going to incorporate those flood depth vulnerability thresholds, which I showed on the, the, the previous slide uh, in the PowerPoint, where we have these four different risk thresholds from low to very high, and they're each related to a different sort of category of flood depth. So what we're going to do is we're going to reclassify this raster uh, map of flood extent and depth to a raster map of levels of flood risk. And we're going to do this using the raster calculator tool. So if we go up to raster and raster calculator, it opens this tool. Um, and this tool allows us to, to calculate different formulas based off the, the values of the cells within the raster. Um, and we're going to be putting in quite a long formula here. Um, in the documentation that we've provided, um, we've also included the formula in there, so you can just copy and paste it, but I'll just talk you through it right now. So the first level of flood risk, the low uh, level of flood risk, is all flood depths with uh, a depth below 0 0.15 meters. So we'll do the flood map less than 0 0.15 and we'll say that all values with a flood depth less than 0 0.15 should equal one so that's the first risk uh risk category then for the second risk category we say it's all flood depths greater than or equal to uh 0 0.15 meters but also less than half a meter and for this second risk threshold, we'll assign all these cells a value of two. For the third risk threshold, this is flood depths between half a meter, so greater than or equal to half a meter, but also less than one and a half meters. And we'll assign all these cells a, a value of three. And then the final flood risk category is this very high risk category. And this is all cells with a flood depth greater than or equal to one and a half meters. And we'll assign this a value of four. 
And now that we've got the, the formula that we're going to use to, to calculate this, this layer, we then also need to choose where we want to save this layer. So let's uh, navigate to our, uh, our flood folder and let's call this flood risk RP100. And we'll click save and we'll click OK to run the tool. So once the tool is finished, it's now created a, a new raster um, with four different uh, values, uh, ranging from one to four, depending on the level of risk that that uh, cell represents. Um, but you can see it's still got the default QGIS styling attached to it. So let's update the styling so we can better view what the flood risk looks like within the camp. So let's right click the, the layer, go to properties, make sure we're in symbology. Let's click on style in the bottom left hand corner, load style, and then in the flood folder, let's, we've also pre-created a, a flood risk style uh, setting. So we'll click on that and we'll click open click OK, and now we can see our, our flood map, our flood risk map has been reclassified based on the level of flood risk that each cell represents. So you can see these green cells are where there's low risk, yellow cells where there's medium risk, orange cells are where there's high risk, and red cells is where there's very high risk. And you can see that the, the different buildings within the camp are exposed to different levels of flood risk. So the final step we're going to do in this exercise is we're going to classify these individual building footprints by the level of flood risk that they're exposed to. And to do this, we're again going to use the zonal statistics tool. So we'll go over to here to the processing toolbox, double click on zonal statistics. This time for the input layer, we choose our, our building footprint data. And for our raster layer, we choose the flood risk layer. And here for the output column prefix, we write risk. And the statistics we want to calculate this time are is just maximum. So we want to calculate the maximum level of flood risk that each building is exposed to. And again, we'll just create a temporary layer. We'll click run. And this will produce another uh, version of the, the, the footprint data with an additional column classifying each footprint by the level of flood risk it's exposed to. And we just want to update this building footprint uh, data set with uh, some styling. So we want to style it in a similar vein to how we've styled the, the flood risk map. So let's click on Let's right click on the layer we just produced. We'll go to properties. We'll again go to symbology in the bottom left hand corner, click on style and load style. And then we'll navigate to our, our building footprint data. And again, we've produced this uh, footprint styling uh, information that you can just directly apply to the building footprint data. So let's click open, load style, and if we click OK, we can see that now the buildings within the camp have been reclassified based off the level of risk that they're exposed to. So you can now zoom in and identify which buildings are exposed to flooding but also identify which buildings are exposed to different sort of severity uh, of flooding. And this can help begin to inform you about the specific risk reduction measures that you might take for, for different buildings within the camp. So um, just to summarize what we just went through. Um, so I walked you through a simplified analysis based on the paper we published back in 2023. Um, and in the first exercise, we conducted a camp flood exposure assessment at the national scale. Um, this gave us the number of refugees and percentage of refugees exposed to flooding in each camp. And an analysis like this could be used to, to understand risk across camps in a country such as Ethiopia and can also help 
pinpoint camps for further detailed analysis. In the second exercise, we chose a single camp to do a more detailed analysis, and we incorporated building footprint data and simple vulnerability information to understand how structures within the camp are exposed to flood risk. And this could be useful in beginning to identify how risk is distributed within the camp and which structures are most at risk. And it could be used to inform discussions around specific risk reduction measures to take. So this exercise was intended to give you a very brief introduction to global flood risk data and also the ways that it may be used in assessments of refugee camp flood risk. I'll now hand over to, to Luxton and Ruby, who will be sharing experiences and perspectives about how flood risk is currently being managed in, in refugee camp settings. So thanks, Mark. Uh, my name is Lapson Katsi, uh, and flood management and response is of immense interest to me and my role, and uh, especially considering my role with the refugees, where in refugee camp setups, managing flood risk is crucial for the safety and well-being of refugees, surrounding host communities, and humanitarian staff and property. So me and my colleague Ruby will be talking about the ground realities and currently what we are doing to manage uh, flooding in, uh, in, in the refugee camps. Over to you, Ruby, to introduce yourself. Thanks, Luxon. My name is Ruby Patterson, and um, shortly I'll be speaking about some um, research I did in flood management decision-making processes in East African refugee camps. Thanks, Luxon. Thank you, Ruby. So currently, I'm sure you're all aware of the, currently in East Africa, thousands, including refugees, are caught up in the ongoing El Nino triggered heavy rains and severe flooding. And uh, this has resulted in, again, secondary displacements of the people who have already been displaced, but now because of the flooding, they have to, to relocate to some other places of safety. For example, in Kenya, nearly 20,000 people in the Dadaab refugee camps have been displaced due to the rising water um, after several weeks of uh, torrential rains. Uh, and in Burundi, about 32,000 refugees are living in areas which have been affected by flooding. Uh, and in Tanzania, the situation is also worse. Over 200,000 refugees in the camps have been impacted by the flooding. Um, so, and in Tanzania also, the same, even the UNHCR office in Kigoma was badly affected by by the flooding. So now I'll take you through how is flood risk currently managed in the camps. Uh, so, for example, uh, this will be in two ways. For example, when you are setting up a new camp, what do we need to do? Uh, there will be a much a much functional team which will do a risk analysis and. Uh, uh, evaluation, and then what this function, uh, multifunctional functional team does is it is a site assessment form, uh, which the site assessment form has got uh, some uh, some sections. If there are red lines, these are alleged flooding, which are be flagging the critical issues, rendering the site unsuitable for development. But then there are also sections on that same form which shows the red lines. Uh, and these are alerts flagging the, that heavy mitigation activities will be required to enable the development of the site. So the site, the site assessment form also has issues to do with topography and drainage where it will give you the slope percentage, the soil, the soil type, the soil condition, and the drainage patterns of that particular place. Then it also gives climatic conditions, the environmental aspects, then public health issues and natural hazards, which would be prevalent in that location. Uh, it also shows uh, some historical data in terms of uh, if the area is prone to flooding. And it also, this form also shows the average rain for per season and the land use pattern in that, uh, in that particular location. On the same form, which we use for site assessment, it also uh, has aspects to do with the vulnerability status analysis where we are looking at the age, the gender, and the disability, 
uh, of the people uh, who are living in the in that area. And then, as part of the the site assess, assessment, we do the recommendations, uh, and mainly the recommendations are to do with uh, site improvement and mitigation measures, which needs to be done mostly before the refugees are moved to to that particular location. Uh, and then on this particular slide, what um, I'm trying to illustrate on this slide is this is for the now existing camps. What do we do for the existing camps? For the existing camps, again, we do periodic mod functional uh, assessments. Uh, sorry, we do uh, periodic mod functional risk assessments, which again are done by a team from the watch sector, the shelter and settlement planning, our public health uh, teams, education, protection. Then we also have government, local authorities and partners, and also even people from the host community representatives, they also be part of it. And then based on that, then we'll come up with a flood preparedness and response strategy. And then in terms of preparedness, there's uh, preparedness mitigation response. There's a range of activities which we do. For example, on the structural aspect, this in involves site improvement, drainage improvements, then the construction of trenches and decks to prevent and control the penetration of runoff. And then also we do soil stabilization through tree planting. Then you also do something like creation of percolation pits and also promoting rainwater harvesting to uh, to support as part of the, the preparedness. And then you also have non-structural measures as part of the, the preparedness response measures, what we do. Uh, for example, early warning systems, trying to give warning to the to the refugees and the host communities living in those flood prone areas. Then also relocation of families, and then also awareness raising and advocacy for other land pieces which can be used. Uh, then also evacuation and training and education uh, of the refugees and some host communities living around uh, around those areas. And then also we do camp coordination and management with uh, various government land ministries uh, and departments and also the local representatives from the uh, from the, the from the local government in terms of uh, preparing for for, for the, the flooding and also as part of the the, the response the, the, the response measures but then this comes with uh, a list of its own challenges you know it's not easy uh, to to manage flood risk in refugee camps so for example siting siting is one of the key challenges which we have where most of the refugee camps are often located in climate vulnerable locations with very poor quality land and harsh climatic um, conditions which are prone to extreme weather conditions such as flooding so it becomes very difficult society becomes one of the key challenges which we have and then the other challenge is overcrowding uh, there's limited space to relocate the refugees due to congestion so even if in the uh, in light of the ref I mean of flooding uh, coming, sometimes you don't have land to 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 relocate these refugees because of overcrowding. Then the other one is reluctance from the refugees themselves, even in light of pending disaster. Some refugees oftentimes refuse to be moved, and uh, we don't really force them to move if if, if they don't want. And uh, one of the key challenges is something to do with family ties. This is one of the key challenges in locating the refugees for fear of separating from their families, tribes, and even the clan. So you might want to relocate to, to move some of the, 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 the families which might be right seated on the waterway, but then they might have some of their relatives who are still in the same uh, location. So this brings some reluctance for them to move. And one of the other challenge is security and protection concerns. You see, so it might be fear of secondary displacement. So the refugees end up, they don't want to be moved. They want to just to settle, even if 
they are flooding, which we, we which will be coming to, to those locations. Um, then another challenge is funding, limited funding to provide for site improvement works, mitigation and response amid this provision of basic humanitarian life saving uh, services. So this becomes a, a, a key challenge to in trying to manage uh, re, uh, flooding in these locations. Um, and then in terms of the future of flood risk management in the camp setup settings, I think one of them is, I think, to see uh, flooding as an opportunity we, we, where we need to move from flooding, from flood control to flood resilience and adapting. I think we need to live with the flooding because there is no way, we, what we can only do, we cannot avoid the flooding, but what we can do is to mitigate. Uh, so we might minimize the effects and take advantage of flood benefits uh, and then in, invest in nature-based solutions uh, and integrated water source management and also use flooding as an opportunity to, to recharge uh, underground water preserves. And then also, there's, we also need to look at uh, leveraging on indigenous knowledge so we need to build on indigenous knowledge uh, where science will come in to, to build on what the local people already know uh, and not to, to ignore what the, the local people already know. And then the other aspect to, to really look into the future is the setting of the camps right from, 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 from the goal, uh, trying to negotiate and advocate for, for suitable land, which is not known to be prone to flooding. Um, and then one of the other key issues is to, to manage refugees and the host community perceptions, because you oftentimes uh, realize these are people who have been living in some of these locations for years, and um, they tell you they've seen it all. So even if you want to evacuate them to some other locations, they are still, they are not interested. So I think there's need to manage the their perceptions and thinking. Uh, and another aspect is really making data available to decision makers in terms of flood mapping. So there's a lot which is out there, but this really needs to be shared with uh, the local government authorities and try to interpret it to them in a way they understand uh, in, in, as part of the, the mitigation and preparedness measures. And then there's also need to really put a lot of uh, effort in. In, in research and information archiving and sharing and dissemination uh, to support uh, government in these uh, low income countries, really with um, uh, even research, be it at MSc level, PhD level, uh, having some students attached to some of these uh, offices and then carrying out uh, research and then interpreting to them what it means and what needs to be done. Thank you very much for, for your time. Uh, I'm now handing over to my colleague, Ruby. Thank you. Ruby, over to you. Thanks, Luxon, for passing over. Um, so I'm Ruby Patterson, and as part of my master's in water and sanitation en health engineering at the University of Leeds, I completed a research investigation into flood risk management in refugee camps in East Africa. Um, so this investigation covered a critical analysis of guidance resources available to those working in the context, which are outlined in the graphic just here, and interviews with professionals working on flood management in refugee camps in East Africa. Um, these are people working across WASH and Shelter at UNHCR, UNICEF and the Health NGO. The investigation looked to consider what guides those responsible for making decisions, how decisions are ultimately made, and the challenges is those responsible for decision making face in ensuring that the choices they take are effective in preventing and reducing the risk of flooding. So the investigation concluded that no one process is used for flood management decision making processes and they vary because of the complex and different contexts. The investigation found that there are a broad range of resources to support decision making, but there was no one guidance that was used across the board. And this again is explained by the complexities of refugee camps. Um, the challenges facing decision makers to manage flooding is often out of their hands and preparation and previous learnings are vital in response to flood events. 
So I'm just going to show this slide here, um, which kind of briefly outlines some of the complexities and challenges in managing flood risk. Um, there's issues such as limited funding, resources and issues of capacity. Um, but there are three main um, challenges that I've highlighted just in red rings there um, that um, I would like to kind of discuss. So um, one of them is the nature of humanitarian crisis, um, the kind of um, hierarchy of responsibility. So country governments are ultimately responsible and um, site allocation. So if I move on. Um, so the nature of a humanitarian crisis means that there can be no one size fits all response. Um, this was consistently highlighted across um, the guidance literature analysed and um, through the interviews. Um, there are many moving parts of a humanitarian response um, which poses a challenge as timing can be critical and camp managers often have multiple contending issues to deal with. Um, interviewees spoke of how the situation initially for the first two weeks are chaotic, therefore consideration to issues of flooding are not necessarily a priority and um, the situation does not allow for ideal and well considered decisions to be made. For example, one interviewee highlighted that tools available in flood forecasting um, and prediction were beneficial, but often the timing and spontaneous nature of humanitarian crisis meant that refugees had settled in camps before these assessments could be completed or this data could be used to confirm the suitability of a location. Um, again, interviewees noted that a significant lack of recorded data as a result of the nature of the situation um, meant that responses could be more timely and more effective if the data had been available. And evidence-based learning appears really critical in managing flood risk in camps. So again, um, kind of the nature of the situation means that um, refugee camps are temporary and uh, the issue of temporality was discussed by many interviewees. They noted that um, as a result of this there was limited investment into infrastructure that could support reduce the risk posed by flooding. So for example um, the development of drainage systems or improved solid waste management that could have kind of contributed to reduce risk of disease and illnesses once flood events had occurred and prevent um, exacerbating flood events. One interviewee discussed that a camp that they had worked in in Ethiopia had been in existence for 30 years with the same people living in the camp all that time and obviously the original intention of the camp was that these people were there on a temporary basis and would return to their home. This was however not the case. Um, these people living there had developed uh, mechanisms to deal with flooding themselves but they were still left vulnerable as a result of um, this lack of proper investment and in infrastructure. It seems that both country governments and organisations like UNHCR are faced with the dilemma of whether to invest in infrastructure that can withstand the impact of flooding and selection of refugee camps with flood risk in mind and accept that despite the mandate to ensure camps remain temporary in their nature, also ensure that they are sustainable to the lives of the vulnerable people living there. Um, so the hierarchy of responsibility was highlighted as a challenge as part of managing flood risk in refugee camps. Um, the responsibility for managing refugee and IDP camps lies ultimately with the host government. However, over two thirds of all refugees are found in low and middle income countries which are already facing challenges. Um, UNHCR is never meant to have full responsibility of management of camps and they work together with country governments to support their coordination. The diagram on the right here um, maps out the complex relationships between the different agencies and bodies involved in flood management in refugee camps and this is specifically in East Africa. Um, this can cause challenges and complexities in coordination between the groups and there's a difference of motivations and conflicting interests. Camp siting was discussed by interviewees as a challenge within these groups because of the um, conflicting and competing motivations between the groups. This investigation found that site location was a challenge that was influenced by and influencing poor decision making in managing flooding in refugee camps. 
The site environmental assessment tools are critical in supporting decision making around camp locations. However, um, we found in this research that oftentimes camp locations were in places at risk of flooding and had been located there despite environmental assessments. The reason from this ranged with some interviewees noting that there was often no other option and decision makers hands were tied. There were also other considerations to take into account when citing a camp, um, for example, distance from the border and the risk of cross border attacks. In addition to this, interviewees noted that the nature of humanitarian crisis meant that people have often settled in locations before they have been allocated as designated refugee or IDP camps. Um, now I'm just going to share a summary of this session. Um, so it's evident that it's important to assess flood risk for refugee camps due to heightened exposure and vulnerabilities of the people living there. We know that in the past there have been challenges in applying flood risk methods because of data availability in these contexts. But thanks to the recent advancements in global data sets, which have been generated by global models and remote sensing observations, we're transforming what's possible and we're able to begin to use this technology to support and help us begin flood risk in camps. However, as highlighted by Luxon and myself, we know that these analytical assessments are not able on their own to solve the problem due to the very complex and unique context of refugee camps. There are vulnerabilities that were touched on in the research and there are still big gaps in our understanding. So thank you very much for joining us today um, and attending this session. Um, I'm going to pass back over to Sean now. Thank you, Ruby, Luxon, Mark, and Mark for the excellent presentations and demonstration. Before we transition to the question and answer session, I want to remind you there will be one homework assignment which you will be able to access from the training page on June 20th. Answers must be submitted by Google Form with a due date of July 5th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars, complete the homework assignment by the deadline, and you will receive a certificate via email approximately two months after the completion of the course. Below is the contact information for today's trainers, along with links to the RSET website and social media. If you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you will sign up on the RSET listserv to receive notifications of future trainings, and follow us on social media for other relevant announcements pertaining to NASA's Earth Sciences. We will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's training. Please enter your questions in the question and answer box and we will get to them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training webpage before the start of next week's training. We want to thank everybody that's been submitting questions. We've gotten some really great ones so far and again, there's still plenty of time. So if you have a question and you've not posed it yet, please do submit it and we will get to it in the order it was received. So jumping right in question number one, does the difference observed due to geological setting, pluvial or fluvial, et cetera, in the predictions make for a flood effect? And whoever I'll answered this, one, feel one. free to unmute. I'll take this one. It's Mark Trigg here. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't 100% sure what the question was getting at there, but I think the question is related to the characteristics of the context. So, uh, geological setting was mentioned, but uh, topography and other characteristics of the area will obviously make a difference to the flood that's experienced there. Uh, the global flood models that we're using do take into account these characteristics. So. The flood hazard maps that you see will be a result of uh, underlying geology, um, local rainfall, and so on. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Mark. Question number two What is the resolution of the flood rasters? All right, yeah, I can take this one. Um, so, the flood data that we use uh, comes from Fathom Global, and we use their, their version 2 flood maps, which have a horizontal resolution at the equator of, of roughly 90 meters. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Question number three, how do you add the Google map in the XYZ file? Yeah, so I think this was actually answered in the chat during the session, but um, I've included a link there as well, which um, explains how you can uh, add those base maps in QGIS. 
Terrific. Thank you again, Mark. Question number four, where did you get the flood map from? So, yeah, like I just mentioned, the, the flood maps are, are from Fathom Global, um, which is a, a global flood modeling company based in Bristol. Um, and you can get these data directly from Fathom um, for research purposes, and their, their data is also used for sort of humanitarian purposes. But we've also included the data that we used in the exercise in the, the repository that I've linked there. So you can use those flood maps to, to recreate the exercise we, we just went through. Um, I guess we sh one thing we should note is there are also a number of other global flood models available, ones that are also uh, a bit easier to download openly online. Uh, for example, uh, we've linked here the, the JRC global flood maps. Um, there are some uh, global flood maps from, from WRI Aqueduct. Um, but these flood maps tend to be at a coarser resolution, and many of them will only be modeling floods on the largest rivers. So uh, when we're thinking about modeling uh, flood risk for refugee camps, one thing that we found in, in the paper we wrote is that many of these camps are located uh, or are at risk to flooding from smaller rivers, which are, which are missed in many of these global flood maps. So the choice of your global flood map also becomes very important in, in these situations. Thank you, Mark. Question number five, how exactly were the pluvial and fluvial maps combined? So for the purpose of this exercise, just to, to keep it fairly simple, we just combine these data sets by merging two separate rasters. So we have the fluvial, the river flood maps, and the pluvial, the, the, the rainfall derived maps. So we just combine them and in the cells where, where there was flooding from, from both maps, we just retain the maximum flood depth. So we just got the maximum flood depth of either the fluvial or the pluvial maps. In the paper that the sort of analysis is based on, we actually calculate the fluvial and pluvial risk separately. But for the purpose of this exercise, um, we, we calculated them together. Great, question number six uh, has to refer to Earth Engine. So QGS is to be run on local systems, but if we run on clouds for a larger analysis, we could rely upon Google Earth Engine especially using this package with the pro version of Google Lab. Any light on that? I'll so, pass over to Mark Trigg. Yeah, for... I was going to say I'll answer this one. So I, I, we've not used Google Earth Engine specifically for the risk uh, analysis uh, before, uh, although we do use it for other uh, purposes. Essentially, the methodology that we've applied can be duplicated on most geospatial analysis type systems. So you could use Arc or you could use, um, I'm sure you could use Google Earth Engine uh, if you had the right skills to use it. Um, we've found sometimes the vector data, using vector data in Google Earth Engine is a little bit more complicated, so we tend to stick to GIS type packages, um, but yeah, essentially the process is fairly straightforward in most packages. Great question number seven. Okay, the best free MSS product is uh, Sentinel two, if not with synthetic aperture radar on Google Earth Engine. It is now Sentinel two harmonized. Could the earlier MSS products? resolution effectively be manipulated in a certain manner other than resampling on cloud? So I wasn't 100% clear on what the question was specific to the flood analysis, but just to point out, I guess, that uh, Sentinel-2 is used for monitoring floods, um, or as it suffers from cloud obstruction. Uh, and Sentinel-1, for example, the radar is also used um, However, what we're using in this analysis is a global flood model output. So it's not an observed flood, it's a modeled flood. Uh, so we might use Sentinel to test those models, but essentially we're modeling a kind of synthetic flood for a specific probability. Uh, great, thank you, Mark. Question number eight. 
Uh, to clarify, the flood count is binary, right? It doesn't include depth information? Yeah, so I think this refers to, to exercise one of the hands-on exercise um, where we were just calculating the, the flood exposure to the different camps. And yeah, um, we just looked at binary, uh, is there a flood, is there no flood? So yeah, the flood count was binary for exercise one. Um, for exercise two, when we began to look at risk, that's when we, we incorporated the, the depth information. Thank you, Mark. Question number nine. Is there also a workshop on how to create the preloaded slash pre-created files or data for when you are starting from scratch? So many of the, the data sets that we actually used in this exercise were, were outputs from, from previous studies. Um, so for example, the, the flood maps we use uh, were produced by Fathom Global. Um, and I've linked the paper here. Um, describing how these, these flood maps ha have been created at the global scale. Um, the footprint data we use is, is from Google, Google Open Buildings, and I've put a link in there for, for where you can download that data, or from OpenStreetMap, and there's a link in there too. Um, the only sort of, uh, sort of data sets that we sort of created from scratch were the, the camp outlines and, and the information. We describe that in a bit more detail in the paper. Unfortunately, we don't currently have a workshop showing how to produce these from scratch, but they'd be fairly easy to, to produce. Essentially, what we do is we use um, camp point locations that are provided by UNHCR. So we have the lat longs of the different camps. And then just, it's a very uh, manual effort. We, we sort of look at satellite imagery, both from, uh, from Google, as well as uh, the Planet Labs imagery, um, where we can get very recent uh, satellite images. And we use these to, to manually delineate the camps. So we did this for, for most of the camps in the sample. Um, some of the camp boundaries were already included in open street maps. So for the two or three camps where these were, um, where these already existed, we just used, used those boundaries. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Question number 10, how can I calculate a flood map? What data do I need? I'll take this one. Um, so. Obviously, we've used uh, pre kind of created flood maps here from these global flood model providers. Um, but if you want to generate your own flood maps, uh, provided you've got the data and the expertise to build those models, you can certainly do that locally. Uh, we've built quite a few uh, local models for camps using global data sets. So it's kind of a hybrid approach, I guess. Uh, gives us a lot more control over our local model. Uh, we've used topography data such as FabDEMS uh, data, which is a 30 meter resolution data set, so higher than the one we've been using. Uh, we use land use data such as the ESA world cover, which is 10 meters uh, from central two map uh, images. We use that for uh, friction in the model and also infiltration uh, parameters. And then we will put a global rainfall data from era five interim onto that global onto that local flood model. So that uh, we would use some sort of software, hydraulic modeling software such as HackRAS 2D. Uh, we build a local model using these global data sets and produce flood maps from those. Um, but that's kind of a little bit beyond this particular uh, session. Um, Please do contact me if you want to know more about that. Great, Mark, thanks so much. We actually just added a link to an RSA training that was carried out last year, and it was a three part training, but one of the parts focused entirely on using synthetic aperture radar for monitoring floods. And for the uh, participant that asked that question, there are probably roughly five or six different RSA trainings. Uh, specifically using primarily SAR data, but also some optical data for monitoring floods. So if, if you're in, of interest, please go to our training page and you can search for those trainings. But again, the most recent training we provided a link to in the Q&A document. So thank you. Question number 11. Sorry, uh, Sean, can I jump back in on Yes, that please, one? Mark, please. Just so that people aren't confused between flood monitoring and flood mapping. 
with models because they are two very different things. So um, the flood mapping with remote sensing is observing an event that happens. Whereas the modeling is uh, often, I mean, you can model an event that's happened, but often you're modeling uh, a hypothetical magnitude of event uh, that may not have been observed with satellites. So it's quite important to distinguish between those two uh, products, I guess, um, but obviously they're used together. <laughs> so uh, it's, yeah, just to clarify that. Great, Mark. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. That that's certainly appropriate. Question number eleven: The open street map and the building footprint layers do not line up exactly. I.e., there are many more buildings in open street map than the footprint layer. How are these data sets calculated? I assume machine learning from Earth observation data, and how reliable slash timely are building footprints shape files? Yeah, so I'll take this one. Um, so yeah, the the footprint data sets don't overlap perfectly. Um, and this is to do with the sort of different approaches for calculating them. Um, so the, the open street map data is primarily sort of community mapped, um, although they're beginning to incorporate some of these machine learning approaches into their mapping, whereas the Google data is entirely machine learning based um, using Earth observation data. So the, the different approaches uh, contribute to some of these differences. Um, but another reason for the differences is uh, related to sort of when these data sets were, were collected or produced uh, temporally. Um, so the open street map data, because it's community mapped, is sort of updated on a continuous basis, but this can be, be quite irregular, uh, especially for refugee camps. Um, the Google Open Buildings data um, on the other hand, has different iterations at different snapshots and snapshots in time. So for this tutorial, we use the version two of Google Open Buildings, which is based in 2022. Um, I should note that the, the data set has updated um, since since we've done this analysis to version three. So it could be interesting to look at how um, the, the exposure may have changed in, in the last year. Um, so the the different data sets also show the the sort of footprints at different snapshots in time um so this is another reason for the difference so we did explore the effect that the use of different um building footprint data sets has on the flood risk estimates in our paper and we found that for for most camps the effect was was less than five percent um but in any case i think it just highlights the importance of using multiple different uh, data sets for, for whether it's exposure or hazard to, to begin to capture the uncertainty, um, in, in these risk assessments. Thank you, Mark. Question number 12, in order to achieve the footprints of the settlements and camps, we need a better object recognition model. Otherwise it would take hours to generate vectors. Kindly shed light on that. Is the segment anything model by meta too much to run for this cost? Yeah, good question. So, um, we, the building footprint data that we use, uh, were, were sort of pre-generated. Um, so either the, the open street map data or the Google open buildings data, we were just able to download from, from their relevant repositories. Um, and because these data sets already exist, um, that means we don't need to account for, for computation time for generating the vectors. Um, I've not personally used the segment anything model, um, but I think it would be really interesting to explore how that model could be uh, used uh, in this context, especially in camps that might be lacking uh, really up-to-date uh, footprint data. So maybe this is something to, to explore for a single refugee camp to see whether it's uh, how computationally complex it is, and then you can explore how this could then scale perhaps to the national scale or or even the regional or global scale. So yeah, maybe maybe something to explore further. Great, thank you, Mark. Question number 13, how do you make per style for each layer? Um, so I, I'm guessing that this question refers to the the styling for the, the raster layers and the, the vector layers. Um, so I, I I left that out of the tutorial because that might have taken uh, a bit longer and um, probably would have taken away from this sort of core core training. But I've put a 
a link to some QGIS documentation, which shows how you can change the styling. Um, so I'd, I'd encourage you to have a look at that to, to, to see how to do that. Great, thank you, Mark. And looking at the time, we are almost at the uh, end of the training, but I did wanna leave a little bit of time. First, I wanna, I wanna say to everybody, for everybody that did uh, pose a question and they were not answered here, we will be going through and answering all of them and they will be posted to the training page before part two of the uh, of this of this webinar series. So, uh, uh, so for those that did ask a question, do not worry; it will be answered. It will be posted to the training page, and it will be posted before the next part, part two of the training. But I did want to respect everybody's time, and I also wanted to give all of the uh, presenters today an opportunity to maybe reflect and have any uh, closing comments and thoughts and reflections for the participants. So, uh, Dr. Trigg, maybe we can start with you, and uh, any closing thoughts and comments you might have for the participants joining today. Sure. Um, so I've just actually linked to the questions. There's been a couple of questions which we haven't got to yet, but uh, questions are related to are these assessments used in an anticipatory way for citing camps uh, at this point? Uh, I, I think the answer is uh, not yet, um, but there's certainly discussions and we're collaborating with Luxon from UNHCR to kind of look at this issue and see how best to incorporate uh, these things. So that's the kind of exciting bit that we're interested in as researchers, but actually trying to kind of understand how to use this data is the next challenge, I guess, um, because these decision-making processes are very complicated. So, I, you know, I don't want people to go away thinking everything's uh, figured out. Uh, this is something that's kind of an active part of our research at the moment. So, you know, if you've got ideas or thoughts you want to throw our way, please do get in contact. Uh, we're very open to uh, collaborating with people. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mark. And, and uh, Dr. Berthoffen? Yeah, just to, to echo what Mark said. Um, yeah, thank you very much for, for your interest in this session. Um, and yeah, um, we're we're more than happy to to work together with with anybody that's that's interested in doing this type of research and applying these uh, data sets in this way. So yeah, please do get in touch if if you're interested in learning more or or potentially collaborating on some work. Great, thank you, Mark and and Luxon. Thank you, thank you very much, Sin. I, I think there is already a question which I think I will provide the, the, the response uh, in detail. But what I want to say is I think there's a lot of data which is out there. You can see from this uh, presentation which uh, we have done with colleagues. But then I think there's a lot more which is required in terms of advocacy with governments uh, because that data is there, but still you will see the sighting of uh, of refugee camps is not an easy process. It involves a lot of negotiations. Uh, so there's still a lot which, which, which still needs to be done, but I will provide a very comprehensive response to uh, the question which has been posted on the chat box. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Luxon. And, and Ruby, any closing thoughts or comments for the participants? Um, no, just to say thank you for joining us um, and echoing what has just been said by Mark, Mark and Luxon. Um, I think there's still so much that needs to be kind of like figured out um, and there's lots of data available um, and lots of people working on this who are willing to collaborate. So yeah, thanks for joining us everybody. Wonderful. And and Ruby, Luxon, Mark and Mark, thank you all so much. Such a, an amazing presentation and demonstration and just a, a stellar job answering so many of these questions. Terrific questions, by the way, from our participants. And uh, for everybody joining today, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you next week, next Thursday at the same time uh, for part two of the webinar series. So wishing you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.